Hello, members of the Digital Library Federation. It's so good to be back with you for this year's forum. This time around, I'll be in conversation with Nicole Hannah-Jones. We are joining you today from the campus of Howard University, where we are both professors in the journalism program in the Kathy Hughes School of Communications, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Nicole Hannah-Jones, ladies and gentlemen, is a superstar and an award-winning investigative reporter who covers civil rights and racial injustice for the New York Times Magazine. In 2020, she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for commentary for her groundbreaking 1619 project, a much-needed corrective reevaluation of the master narrative of American history. This project powerfully demonstrates how slavery, violence, and systemic racial oppression have always been the fulcrum on which the story of this nation turns. And it also places black Americans as central actors in the creation and intergenerational preservation of democracy. The 1619 Project has generated a great deal of controversy and fierce backlash. A year and a half later, folks are still arguing about it and scapegoating the messenger rather than the issues unearthed. That's because we're living in a historical moment when nothing is racist to racists except black people writing about racism. For those of you who attended last year's forum, you may recall that I delivered the keynote address. Some things have changed over the past year while others remain the same. We are still living in precarious times. The scourge of this deadly pandemic is still claiming precious lives every day. And there is still a restless reckoning around race in America. Last year, I posed a very important question to the DLF community. Do black lives matter in the glams, to galleries, to libraries, to archives, and to museums? I left the audience with a call to action. Commit to build a more diverse community of practitioners working in these spaces, reconsider how decisions are made at the top about funding, hiring practices, and about whose stories and documents get preserved. Make visible the collections of marginalized communities, which too often remain hidden. Invest in archives and research centers at historically black colleges and universities with deteriorating infrastructures and collections, which are in danger of being lost. Here we are, one year later, and the DLF community continues to grapple with many of these issues in a society still struggling with social justice issues. The clarion call for the GLAMS is to support telling stories that are grounded in historical facts, to support and empower librarians, scholars, journalists, curators, digital storytellers, and archivists who are doing the digging, curating, preservation, and outreach work from a place of truth so that we will not continue to be a society that perpetuates lies into the future. And with that said, I'd like to welcome Nicole Hannah-Jones. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Good to be here with you. It's great to be here with you. So we have a hero in common, Ida B. Wells Barnett, black woman, investigative journalist. And she once said, to right wrongs, we must turn the light of truth upon them. So how does this principle shape the work that you do as an investigative journalist? Thanks for asking about yeah, our, our common Shiro. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett was the first example I had of an investigative reporter who looked like me and who was doing uh, the type of urgent work that I wanted to do. And um, I think that m her mantra is really a mantra of our profession which is we understand that our job is to hold the powerful accountable, uh, to expose uh, the way that they wield that power against the vulnerable in, in the hopes that an informed citizenry uh, will actually act and respond when injustice is exposed. So um, that's really been my guiding light through uh, my 20 year career as a journalist. And she was quite fearless as well. Absolutely. Gangsta in some respects. Absolutely. Uh, I always say she was the bossest uh, black woman or really um, journalist. She, she was uh, fearless in a way that when we use that word today, it has a very different meaning. You know, this is a, a black woman uh, born into slavery 
um, who uh, comes up during Reconstruction and is challenging authority when um, black people didn't have legal protections, law enforcement was part of the lynch mob, uh, and she was going into communities that had literally just murdered black people, um, sometimes stealing them from the jail and investigating and asking questions. Uh, she also was an innovator in our profession. She was one of the original data reporters, one of the first to start uh, tracking actually how many lynchings were happening and what were the excuses given for those lynchings versus the reality. Um, and you know, she was a, a, a intersectional woman before that was a term. Mm -hmm. She was a suffragist, uh, she was a feminist, she was a, a civil rights leader, she was a journalist, uh, she was all of those things. Mm -hmm. And in a five foot, 100 pound body. Yes. Tiny little something. So, on any given day, I tell people um, uh, I'm, I'm both a historian and a journalist. So, some days I'll say, I'm a journalist who writes history, or I'm a historian who does journalism. So, are you a journalist who writes history, or do you consider yourself a journalist who writes the first draft of history? Um, both. Uh, I think that. Um, all of my journalism has always been informed by history. Uh, I'm a lay historian. I, um, I don't have degrees in, well, actually I have an undergraduate degree in history and African American studies. And I always do um, some original archival research in my own reporting. Uh, but I think I, I've, you know, we do both. We are both uh, cataloging what's happening in our society right now, understanding that uh, we will be the primary source material for future historians. And um, I'm also using historical research um, in my journalism to try to excavate the society that we live in now. Mm -hmm. The 1619 Project. Can you tell the DLF community what inspired this project? How did you come to it? Mm. Um, I'm going to try to give the short answer of that, but uh, in some ways, 1619 was inspired by a high school black studies course that I took a uh, few years ago. Um, and I, I went to high school in the Midwest. My high school offered a one semester black studies elective taught by Mr. Ray Dial, who was uh, the first and only black male teacher I had in my K-12 education. And um, in that one class, I learned more about black people in America, in uh, Africa, uh, than I'd learned in my entire education up until that point. And, you know, it was three months, and I learned more than I'd ever learned. And I came, uh, really became obsessed with learning that history. And so I would ask Mr. Dow to give me books to read on my own. And one of the books he gave me was Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett. And I still have Classic. that copy. Uh, sadly, I never gave it back to Mr. Dow, but <laughs> I, I think he, he, he said he has replaced it. I talked to him recently. Um, and so about 30 pages in, I came across the date 1619. And it, it was like a lightning bolt moment where I realized, I thought the title of the book before the Mayflower was talking about African history that predated the Mayflower. I didn't realize it was talking about an American history and really uh, you know, saying we all learn about the Mayflower in 1620, but there was another ship that arrived a year earlier. Um, and that was so symbolic of both erasure of how our stories and our histories as black, of black people had been kind of erased from the common narrative. Um, but it was also um, a power of legacy, which is that it meant a lot to me as a black child to know that our ancestors had been here uh, since just 12 years after the English who got all the credit for it. Um, so I've been thinking about that power of that date and also that erased history for my entire adult life. Uh, fast forward 20 years, 30 years, um, and I'm not a high school student anymore, I'm at the New York Times, and I'm thinking a lot about this 400 year anniversary is approaching of this momentous date, um, but in a country that has willfully tried to suppress uh, the legacy of slavery that has not wanted to deal with it. And I decided I wanted to pitch a project to um, force one, that date into the lexicon. You know, black scholars uh, know that date, but the average American, um, when I, th you know, in 2018, had never heard of the date 1619. And so um, I wanted to force the date into the lexicon, but I also wanted to use it as an opportunity 
uh, to force a reckoning with our history and to really say slavery is um, a foundational American institution. It's not an asterisk, it's not marginal, it's at the center. Uh, and that's um, how I came up with the project. And the 1619 Project is a collaboration. Yes. You have uh, yeah. uh, photographers, uh, literary folks, some heavy hitting historians who I you know, know as someone who holds a PhD in African American history, uh, museum curators, all that. So could you talk a little bit about that kind of uh, collaboration? And do you see this uh, kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration as a new way to do public history and to present history to um, uh, folks from an educational perspective? Yeah, it, I, I knew when I um, decided I was gonna pitch something to the New York Times to commemorate 1619 that it had to be big. Um, it couldn't just be me writing an essay, it had to be substantial because how else do you grapple with a 400 year history? Um, we don't have opportunity in this country or really many places to commemorate 400 years of anything. And um, so I knew from the beginning it had to include lots of writers. Um, I knew from the beginning it had to include historians, both um, brainstorming, consulting, and writing. Um, and then it, it, in some ways, the project in and of itself had to serve as a testament uh, to our ancestors and to the 31 million descendants. So as many black voices as we could get across disciplines, um, then the project in and of itself becomes a, a capsule of something, uh, of showing um, that some of the greatest writers in America, historians in America, are black. Not, not the greatest black writers or greatest black historians or black photographers, but we are fully American and have uh, been some of the greatest contributors to culture, writing, um, research. Um, so that was really important in, and it was also the only way you could show the breadth of the argument. Um, I wanted to um, take this story that had been from the margins and show, look at across all these American institutions um, and the shadow of slavery can be seen there even if we've wanted to pretend that it wasn't. Uh, so it just kept kind of getting bigger and bigger um, because it was carrying 400 years of history and even as big as the original project was, uh, now of course you know we're turning it into uh, books and, and the adult book comes out November curriculum. 16th, curriculum, um, podcast, podcast, um, I mean it, it's TV and film um, because people really embraced wanting to learn this history and we could never tell it entirely. We could keep expanding this for the rest of my life um, and we could never tell the story entirely but it was important to, uh, to give us a sense, a peek of, um, of all that could be known but that we're not taught. And I have to tell you, just between you and me, <laughs> um, some of my historian friends, those who've been entrenched in the academy mm -hmm. for 20, 30 years, particularly mm -hmm. in the history profession, uh, have looked at the response to the 1619 Project. And some of them will say, she's a journalist. Yes. Now, I got some of that shade when I was in my PhD program at Rutgers. Um, you know, some of my faculty uh, mentors would say, you don't write like a historian, you write like a journalist as if that was a bad thing. And I would have to remind them that some of the best histories have been written by, you know, uh, journalists. Slavery by another name, Doug Blackman. Um, the Warmth of Other Sons, Isabel, you know, uh, uh, journalists. And so I, I wonder if this kind of collaboration or the fact that you, you know, written in a journalistic voice, but with an eye to the, you know, accuracy of the archives, right. provides some lessons particularly for humanity scholars who for so long have been trained to write for these you know, echo chambers or disciplinary silos. What can they learn from this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've certainly heard some of that criticism, though um, that has not been the typical response from historians, uh, particularly black historians, but historians in general. And you know, my response to that is very simple. The 1619 Project is a work of journalism. It's not a historical text. Um, these are essays that are using history to make an argument. There's reporting. Um, every essay um, 
leads up to the modern day. Uh, all of those essays are, are linked to what, what and who we are in America today, and it's using history to inform that argument. And um, I think we, we shouldn't gatekeep like that, particularly in a time where um, history departments are struggling to attract majors, right? Where we're, we're seeing kind of attacks on the liberal arts, like is, is this a practical skill to have? Well, if only historians should be writing histories or using history, then what is the purpose of the field? Um, I asked this of, of, of one of the critics of the, of the project who was saying, suggesting that journalists shouldn't do journalism because that's what the 1619 Project is. And I said, why, why create histories if you don't want regular people, non-historians, to read your work and use it in their own, to inform their own? Um, so I, I, I don't think that that has been the typical response. And in fact, I've heard from uh, a lot of historians and also K-12 social studies teachers that the project has helped uh, permeate that kind of um, membrane between the academy and regular people's understanding of this history and that it's made students see how relevant history and the study of history is to understanding their world that we live in today. Um, and of course, historians were always a part of the project. Um, in the original project, several of the essays were written by academic historians, Kevin Cruz, Khalil Muhammad. In the book, almost all of the new essays are written by historians. Everyone from you know, Martha Jones, Carol Anderson, Ibram Kendi. Um, so the fact, I think, that so many historians, um, especially those who already are doing a great job of writing for popular audience, in places like the New York Times or the Washington Post. They understand that uh, writing in that way just opens up your research and that understanding to a much bigger audience. And I don't see how that can be a negative. I think the DLF uh, community would like to know more specifically about how the 1619 Project uh, collaborated with the um, museum, the African American Museum in yes. DC. Could you talk a little bit more about that, uh, role, the role that they played in all this? Absolutely. Um, so what we understood is that the magazine part of the project, so the project is um, a magazine and a special section of the newspaper, that because the magazine was not a traditional history, we weren't doing the history of slavery uh, in the magazine. What we were doing was was saying we are going to write essays about the legacy of slavery. Um, that there is so much history that people didn't have in, to begin with. Like we're taught about slavery so poorly that just basic facts of, of this history are not known. Um, so we began thinking pretty early on about collaborating with the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, one of the first things we did when I got the green light to do the project was a group of us went down to the museum. I have uh, been going to the museum since it, since it opened five years ago, but none of um, the other people on the staff who came down had been to the museum. So I wanted them to get an understanding of uh, the stakes and the heaviness of this history. And as you know, if you go into uh, the Slavery and Freedom uh, exhibit at the museum, it's just powerful, Heavy. powerful. Um, and for most Americans, because we don't learn this history very well, it just blows their mind. Like they just had no idea. Um, so when we came back, we started thinking, well, what if we could uh, create a kind of um, broadsheet that mimicked uh, a museum exhibit that would take items from the museum and use that to, to teach a, a brief history of the institution of slavery. And I worked, uh, we, we worked very closely with Mary Elliott, who is also a, a Howard alum um, and is finishing up her PhD in history at Howard. And she was the curator of that museum to select the items in the museum and work in close partnership with such an important um, institution in American life. And uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing partnership. Um, people learned so much and it was digestible because we did tell it around images. So it, it really did function very similar to um, a museum exhibition in that you would have the photo of the object and then just a brief um, I'm talking uh, one sentence. Right, accounting <laughs> of, of what, that, what that image was. Um, so it also, I think, helped lead more people, not that the museum needed 
um, us to help advertise it. I mean, as you know, it, it, it sold out for years. Um, but uh, I think it modeled a type of collaboration that we should see more of, um, which is respecting the storytelling of these institutions and understanding that, again, we, we have a different way of telling that story and getting it out uh, to the public. Because as many visitors as that museum has had, we still know most Americans um, will probably never get to DC to see it in person. Mm -hmm. So the 1619 project wasn't just a print project where people line, literally lined the streets waiting for hard copies of this thing. It was multimedia. Yes. Um, and I'm curious to know uh, what role you played in shaping the online uh, presence of this project. Yeah, so the, um, not a lot. Um, I, I will be very honest by the time, so from the time I pitched the project to publication was about six and a half months, um, and I was completely overwhelmed just trying to get the print part of the project out. And then of course the podcast where um, I was basically the host of, of the podcast that was coming out at the same time. Um, so we relied really heavily on uh, our digital team to kind of come up with the look and the feel um, they presented lots of different ways to tell the stories, and, and, and we did a lot of weighing in on that. Um, I think the biggest thing was creating a design that would allow you to sit with it, because as you know, you know, in this, in this digital world, there's so many distractions, and this is long. The 1619 Project is long. It's a lot of text, a lot of images, um, and how do you get people who are not reading it in print to actually stay with it and, and go through all the different pieces of it. And so they gave a lot of thought to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you've gotten a lot of praise mm -hmm. and you've gotten a lot of scorn. Yes. Uh, what's behind both of these reactions? I think what's behind both of them is actually the same thing. It's just uh, people respond to it very differently, which is this is a history they did not know. Mm -hmm. This was an understanding that they did not have. Um, and so the praise came from, uh, no one ever taught me this, and it makes me see America in a different way that I didn't understand, and I, I didn't know how uh, slavery shaped our politics and, as, or, and our, ca our system of capitalism, um, you know, all of these areas. People just felt this had been a, a history that had been hidden from them and that it, they couldn't help but see their country differently with this uh, framing and these set of facts. Um, and that's also what made people oppose the project, which is um, this unsettling of the, the master narrative, or as I could say, the master's narrative, uh, this putting black people in the center of the American story as the most ardent, freedom fighters and perfectors of democracy that, that this country has ever Which seen. Which was so offensive to a lot of people. It's offensive, exactly, right? So when you look at these kind of counterattacks, the 1776, I mean, I don't even know how many 1776 projects there are now, right? There was the commission, Hillsdale College has their own thing. There's a, a conservative funded black 1776 counter project um, that's seeking to vindicate the narrative of our founding um, but not seeking to tell the truth of our founding. And I think that's where we have to understand um, that what this really is. You know, I've been a journalist for 20 years. I've written about racial inequality my entire career. So what is it about the 1619 Project that's led to this backlash? And that is because it, it is actually about our national identity and how we collectively think about who we are as a country. And that is very scary to people who are used to one narrative that glorifies uh, one group of people and glorifies our country as exceptional. And a um, slow march to liberty. Yes, rather than the inevitable progress. And brutal that's right. past. Right, well that's treated as, that's treated as the exception, mm -hmm. right? We are a great country and yeah, we did some little things like chattel slavery, <laughs> genocide, nice people. but that's Stole not whole who time. we are mm -hmm. as a country. Well, that is who we are as a country. Now I would argue um, that the ideals not of the Constitution originally, but of the Declaration, were majestic ideals. Those are some of the greatest words uh, written uh, in the English language. Um, but we didn't live up to them, and we just have to be honest about that. So 
the response on both sides, had the project not been so successful, had it not started being uh, going into schools, had it not been embraced, you wouldn't see this backlash to the project. The backlash is coming in response, I think, to how effective the project has been, um, along with other works that, that were out, and along, of course, with the racial reckoning last year. Mm -hmm. It's all getting wrapped up uh, and in this thing. demographic shifts in this. Right, there's already these anxieties, mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what we saw last year with the racial reckoning, which of course is already, already done, seems like we've, we've already moved on, um, was people evoking this language of 400 years, of 1619, where, and I've looked a lot at the polling, um, you saw majorities of Americans, majorities of white Americans, and almost half of Republicans who were saying that uh, racial inequality and structural inequality was a primary cause of, uh, of black struggle versus before it was really about individuals. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some individual races and individual black people need to just take advantage of their opportunities. So when you started to see um, this connecting of this past, of this legacy, of this 400 year str struggle and critiques of structure, that's when you see the backlash. That's when we get this whole critical race theory backlash, uh, this made up controversy, because it was um, understanding that kind of the, the genetic wedge of America is race. And all you have to do is start telling white Americans, look, not only are they trying to demographically displace you, but now they want to displace your history and your heroes and tell you that your people were not the greatest people, your people were bad people, which of course is not what any of this work is doing. Um, and that's how you can drive that resentment and change the focus, and it's been very effective. If you were a white male named Nathan Jones, do you think, you know, as a journalist, white male journalist, Nathan Jones, that this backlash would have been as fierce. Does, does being uh, the messenger in your body uh, make a difference in terms yes, of Yes, of course. So two things. Um, I don't think white male Nathan Jones creates the 1619 Project, let's be frank. Um, this is where I talk about how we treat diversity as uh, some nice thing that we should do, like some the right uh, thing to do, but not that it actually is improving our journalism. Not that it's actually like having me in the room or you in the room brings just a different focus and different stories and different reporting. So uh, 1619 Project doesn't exist um, without someone like me in the room. Mm -hmm. And then certainly uh, someone like me being the one at the New York Times, uh, not at you know a black institution, not at a um, lesser known white institution, but at kind of the citadel of, of, of elite American journalism telling this story clearly leads to the backlash. They don't like um, how I talk, how I present. They really hate my hair, right? Like I, I, because it's a rejection of the uniform, right? It's a rejection of um, what they have told us we have to do to be successful. And someone like me should not be able to command a project like this at a place like the New York Times and then have the nerve to not just go quietly about it. So all of that um, is wrapped up in the response, for sure. How dare you, a black woman, invert the gaze onto yes. this master narrative. You know, over the years- And have the nerve to be successful at it. Exactly. If this project had failed at the New York Times- and Doing it in your- No life. one would care. Right, <laughs> right, because yeah. the thing about the project, I mean, this is why, and, and it's not that the project is above critique, of course it is. Um, you don't produce something this ambitious and this big and not expect critique. There's plenty of things that can be done differently, should have been done differently, um, and that's not the, the problem. Um, but it is that we were determined to be unflinching in how we were telling these stories. We weren't going to worry about uh, how did people feel about the, about the stories being told this way. And we were, you know, uh, mainstream journalism centers white people in the white story without saying that's what it's doing. And they call that objective. But we were explicitly saying, we are telling the story of black people in this country. We are centering black people in the narrative of the American story. Um, and we're gonna be explicit about that. And um, 
people had a strong response to that, either positively or negatively. It was about whose voice white America wants yes. to hear. Mm -hmm. Yes, one, one historian critic, um, a Princeton historian. Um, Sean Malins. Not him, actually. Not him? Okay. Though, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sean, Sean Malins uh, has found an unending a desire to, to keep trying to um, not critique the project, but discredit it. Mm -hmm. He's not been successful. But another one um, wrote, you know, slavery was just but a blip in the history of America. And in what other place could uh, the formerly enslaved write something like this from, uh, you know, again, the citadel of American power with the consent of their former enslavers? He wrote this. So what that tells you is that's what it's really about is who should have the control of writing these stories at these elite institutions, and that it shouldn't be me, except it was. There have been times when I've written commentary for the Times, Washington Post, other places, and I consistently, and no matter how surgically precise you are with the facts, right, no matter how deft you are in terms of using the archival material right. to support your point, Inevitably, you get people who say, you hate white people, <laughs> you, you hate America, you're causing all the division. Do you, did you get that kind of response? Of course, of course, right? Um, I mean, there's laws against teaching my project. Two of the most powerful senators, um, Senator Tom Cotton and Mitch McConnell, um, sponsored legislation to prohibit the project from being taught in American schools. Um, so yes, and, and when you read the bills, what the bills say, and you know, I, I'm a good journalist, but I, I'm not that powerful. I can't single-handedly destroy America with the work <laughs> of journalism, right? But that's what it's saying, that, this, that if we tell these stories, uh, this is destructive to America. Now one, that's not my concern as a journalist. My, Concerns the journalists to try to render the truth as closely as I can. Uh, but two, no one who reads my opening essay in the project can come away with anything except a sense of actually patriotism, of saying, my dad flew this flag and I didn't get it, but he actually had every right to fly the flag of the country that his ancestors built. And the critique from the left has been, it's too patriotic, right? So that people would say, that this is a project about hating white people. I don't know where that comes from. Um, or trying to destroy America, I don't know where that comes from. But what I will say is if you think telling an accurate truth about our country might lead children to think our country is racist, then maybe you need to reckon with the fact that our country is racist. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that, right? Because what they're basically saying is we if we taught these truths about what our country actually is, it will give children the perception that we were founded as a racist country. So, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, next. <laughs> so, going into the archives and unearthing some ugly stuff, particularly when you're writing about the history of a community that you belong to. Yes. It can be lonely. It, I, I have shed tears in the archives. I've had to get up from the table, yes. walk away, quit for that day. Um, how has it been for you emotionally to do this work? You know, it's, it's taxing, you know that, um, to just spend month after month after month uh, reading about and thinking about and writing about the horrors, mm -hmm. um, the terrorism, barbarism, the torture um, that, that your, your people had to face, and also still seeing every day uh, black people not being treated as full humans, black people being abused right now. Um, so it's not even something that you can put away as, man, that was messed up a long time ago, like you're still seeing Echoes. it happening right now. It's really hard, and and I, I've said before, you know, I, I drink drink more bourbon than I should probably, right? But at the same time, the beauty of this work and going into the archives is you're also daily inspired 
by what you find, right? That you can go in there and be like in 1830, black people were writing this. Black people were having these color conventions and they were laying the groundwork for the 14th, 15th amendment, right? Like when you see that, that to me is what lets you keep going because part of, again, um, why people have been so angry with the project is we are taught a history that black people are not actors. We are just acted upon. We let people come steal us. We let people enslave us. Then we waited for them to free us. And when you go in the archives and you start seeing, um, you see that we are the agents, that we were always resisting. We were always responding. Uh, we were not even uh, part of the body politic, but refusing to be left outside of it. Um, and that is beautifully fortifying. And it's knowing that um, that makes me never feel burdened by the work, but like blessed every single day that I get to do this for a living and I get to excavate our stories um, for a wider audience, but more importantly for our own communities. So I gotta ask you, cause you're like super famous for doing this work. Am I? Yeah, you are, okay. you are. Um, do you ever get paranoid uh, when you go into a research center, archive, because honestly, I do sometimes, and I don't have the same profile that you do, mm -hmm. but everybody knows that I write about racism. So yes. if I'm coming and I'm looking for something, you know, it's, I'm gonna dig up some ugly. And so I just imagine these people saying like, oh, Nicole Hannah-Jones is here. Lock down the vertical <laughs> files. Tell her that those files have not been processed for digitation. Tell her we have nothing. I'm at a point where I might just, you know, get me a, a really old school Anglo-Saxon archival pseudonym, like <laughs> Lilith Puss Wollstonecraft, something like that, to go into the archives. Um, because I have heard stories mm. where um, things, particularly if you, if you have a, a profile like yours and you're black and you're coming in to write about race, things can't be found. Mm. Uh, so I wonder if you ever think about that, if you ever have that sense of people might hide stuff from me because they know what I'm going to do with it. You know, now now I'm feeling all uh, naive that I haven't been paranoid. <laughs> no, I, so, you know, as an investigative reporter, yes, I always have the sense that people want to hide things from me, um, and many of them do, but not archives. Uh -huh. I, I, haven't, I haven't had that experience. Now, it could be uh, stuff was being hidden and I didn't know it, but... What I found is uh, archivists actually really do care about uh, the story getting out there and that um, they've always been extremely helpful where I'll call looking for one thing and they're like, awesome. oh, but you didn't even, they're like, okay, yes, I'll get you that, but you should look at this. Here's this box. Exactly. <laughs> um, or did you even know that this was in there? This might be something that's interesting for your research. I have found them to be so helpful because one, not a ton of journalists do what we do, which is go to archives. It's not that common. Um, and they understand that when we're going in the archives, we're giving broader audience to the work they do and the collections and they, they don't, you don't get into archival work to preserve things that no one's ever gonna look at. Mm -hmm. You get it to preserve because you hope that it will be of use to our society. So that has not been my experience, but you know, who knows, maybe I should be more paranoid. Critical race theory. Oh Lord. <laughs> There's a lot of misunderstanding about what it yes. actually is. If you had to give a quick definition for the DLF community uh, to clarify, what would it be? So there's uh, critical race theory, the fake uh, conservative propaganda campaign. Um, and then there's critical race theory that is the graduate level uh, theoretical framework that is not even radical because all it's saying is um, we passed all of these civil rights laws. Black people have um, the same legal rights as all American citizens and yet we still see inequality all across American life, why is that? It's because uh, racism and hierarchy is embedded in the structures of our country. And it really started by looking specifically at the legal system. Racism, 
hierarchy is embedded in the legal systems of our country, which is so unradical that I don't even understand what's the controversy, because obviously it is. I mean, I have a book at home that I use for research, and it's just called Race in the Law. It's like two Bibles thick, and it's not a narrative. It's literally just listing race in the law, going back to the 1600s. Um, so actual critical race theory is just a framework uh, to try to understand how 60 years after the civil rights movement, we still have, black people still are on the bottom of every indicator of well-being. That's not controversial to me. Um, is it arguing that racism is embedded into our institutions? Yes, that's not controversial to me. Now, critical race theory, the fake controversy and propaganda campaign, uh, it's just a, a savvy tool to stoke white resentment um, and to really um, use that to uh, create a wedge between um, a multiracial political party, which is uh, the Democrat party, uh, to divide off white voters from that party um, and uh, to also use it um, in order to lay the groundwork to pass really bad regressive policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the fact that we're all talking about it when we know that K-12 teachers were not teaching critical race theory, probably didn't even know what critical race theory was, most of them. Um, and what they're really saying is don't teach about race, don't teach black stories like Ruby Bridges because it makes white children feel bad. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that we're all talking about it though speaks to the success of the, of the propaganda campaign. Mm -hmm. DEI, diversity, equity, mm. and inclusion. There's been a lot of that work uh, over the past year. Do you see this as genuine? Is it window dressing? Is it performative? Is it short-lived? <laughs> I could tell by how you framed that question <laughs> that that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, one, I, I don't think that uh, DEI is ever been effective. I think most um, organizations, it's performative. Um, they tend to put someone in that position who has no power to actually do anything. And then when you know the institution doesn't get transformed and they are like, well, it's ineffective, so we're, we're, not, we're gonna get rid of that person or initiative. Um, I don't even like the word diversity because what I'm, what I'm talking about in my work is redress, justice, not just saying all marginalized people are the same, lumping everyone together and saying, let's talk about how we're all, you know, a beautiful kaleidoscope. No, I wanna talk about um, why are black people at the bottom of every indicator of well-being, and what about your institution is leading to that and then how do you make it right? Um, so I think what's happened is a lot of very poorly done DEI trainings led by people who probably shouldn't be training people um, and, and to what end, I don't know. And then that has a, then been used, of course, against people who are doing actual work for justice. Mm -hmm. And um, it's part of the, the scapegoating of critical race theory is coming from all of these uh, trainings, so-called DEI in these positions that aren't effective. We can just look at a year out from, a year and some months out from all the Black Lives Matter protests. And every company, right, was coming up with this, you know, support of black lives and investing in diversity and inclusion training. And a year later, what's the result? Do more people get hired? Do more people have power? Uh, are you even talking about it anymore? Or did you spend some money bringing someone who made you feel bad for an hour and now you've done your self-flagellation and you can move on without actually fundamentally changing anything. So no, I'm, I'm highly suspicious of almost all of these trainings. Um, and I just think it's an easy way not to have to do the real work. Mm -hmm. You and I are sitting on hallowed ground here at Howard yes. University, the Mecca. Yes. Uh, with a long and rich history of producing change makers, producing journalists and, and others. and. There's also a very rich trove of archival material on this campus. So, and you've bought millions of dollars to, to Howard. Uh, how do you plan to engage students 
uh, in the archives. Spengarn is not far from where we sit. What are your plans to do uh, with journalism students and this material as you move forward here? Yes, thank you for asking that. I know that um, this is such uh, important work for you as well. And this is clearly the right audience to have these conversations because uh, as you know, um, Howard is sitting on really the largest uh, repository of black life in the world. And unfortunately though, because black institutions have always been under-resourced, um, it has not been able to be digitized in the way that it needs to be, which means it, the public can't access this just amazing trove of, of global black life. Um, so I specifically, when I came here, asked to have my office in the undergraduate library, which is where you know those archives are moving, because I'm like, I, I want to be working in those archives. I want to teach uh, budding journalists how to do original archival research. Uh, the black press archives there, um, we're, I'm gonna be teaching classes where we're gonna go in there and read those, right? We're gonna read, uh, you know, the center I'm building is called the Center for Journalism and Democracy. And uh, the democratizing press was the black press. The, it was the black press that was calling out, of course, all the ways that this so-called democracy was failing. And um, I want students to be able to go in there and do original research and go through those archives, smell it and feel it. Um, there's just certain things, you know, you can read a, a book where someone else has done archival research, but that's through their prism. And they've decided what they feel is important for you to know. But some of my greatest finds in my research are things that have never appeared in anybody's book. Um, you know, I did a, I was researching at the, um, the archives at the University of Michigan for this school desegregation case, uh, Milliken v. Bradley. And I was reading the judge's uh, archives over that case. And he was writing um, notes in the margins of the research that was being submitted. And you could see his thinking in a way that never came out in his ruling just because I'm reading his handwritten notes in the archives. Like, that's a beautiful uh, piece of discovery that I don't think enough journalists or, or students um, at all um, get to have. Um, I mean, that's why we love journalism, right? Mm -hmm. It's that digging, it's that, that odyssey of discovery. So I'm so excited uh, to take students into the archives, to have the archivists show them what's in there, uh, to learn how to do this research. Um, but we need funding. And uh, I'm fundraising for the archives to, to help with digitization. Um, my understanding is that at its peak, that archive, um, the Moreland Spingarn had 50 employees, and now it has about five. Um, this is not, uh, these archives are not a treasure for Howard, they are a treasure for the world. And this is not black history, this is American and global history, and um, we as a society can do better, and we need to support these efforts, not just at Howard, but at historically black colleges across the country that were um, archiving black life when white institutions were not interested. They weren't collecting our stories. They weren't collecting our archives. But black people always understood the value and the necessity of doing this. And so all across the country, um, these black archives are housed in institutions that understood the importance of archiving black life, uh, but they need help. And that to me is a societal obligation. One last closing thought for our audience. There's gonna be a lot of conversation at this year's annual forum about self-care, mm -hmm. about building community. So how are you and how have you been taking care of yourself avoiding burnout and building community, doing this work and also being a kind of altar for these national debates and fierce backlash. Thank you for asking that. Um, I say all the time, I, I always get asked that question by other black women <laughs> because uh, clearly black women understand uh, the weight of this work and even though it's work that is not a burden, um, it still is a weight. And, um, you know, I, I, sometimes I'm do, I do better self-care than others, but 
Uh, I used to say my self-care that I just keep working, but that's not actually <laughs> self-care. Um, except I, I do feel like so fulfilled by the work that I do. So I've been trying um, to take more time to not be working on things, to relax. Um, now that we can actually see people sometimes in COVID, because uh, I'm a very social person and, and it really would be being around my friends and you know my, my found family that would nourish me. And, and so uh, spending the last year and a half with all these attacks in isolation, was really taxing. It was not good, but I'm in like a great place right now. Um, I'm so proud of the 1619 book that, that we've put together. Um, and that's coming out soon. In November, yeah, November 16th. And, you know, uh, coming to Howard, which is like my lifelong dream. I know it was a, a dream of yours as well to be here. Um, and just starting institutions that uh, I hope will leave a legacy uh, for, uh, you know, a, for black people who want to be in this struggle. Um, I just feel so fulfilled and grateful, honestly. And then, you know, I'm gonna have some bourbon with some friends tonight. <laughs> Sounds good. I actually lied, I have one more question. Okay. We started this conversation with our ancestors' words, to right wrongs, turn the light of truth on them. For the DLF community, these folks who are in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, what can they do in their day-to-day -day work, in terms of supporting projects like yours, um, you know, research centers across this country, what can they do to live up to that mandate that our ancestor mm. gave to us? That's a great question because um, we actually are in a very dangerous period in this country. I, I worry about you know, these um, memory laws, which are what these anti-critical race theory laws are, um, they're, they're setting the groundwork for really regressive policy. You, you change and control the narrative and that is what uh, allows and justifies policy. So it's not accidental that the same states that are passing those laws are passing laws against um, uh, voting rights, that they're passing laws against women's reproductive rights. Um, and truth is going to become so it's always important but being able to discern what is a fact what what is the true history um, the role of archives and of libraries is just so critical because you have the the document the original document you have access to uh, truth in a way that you know an online publication that can say whatever it wants does not um, but I think folks have to get organized because the opposition is extremely organized and the rest of us don't seem to be. And I, I worry about what that means for our society. Um, I, I've, one of the, a, a great article that came out recently by historian Tim Snyder in the New York Times Magazine, which he called these anti-critical race theory laws memory laws. And it was like one of those things where you read something and you're like, oh my God, that's it. That's right, I hadn't thought about it that way. And what he says is we all have to pick an institution and defend it because we are veering towards authoritarianism and we have to pick an institution and defend it. So my parting words to everyone here is pick your institution and defend it. Um, and if you think, you know, archives or libraries or publicly supported institutions uh, will not be under attack, um, they will be. And uh, they'll cut your budgets. Uh, they'll try to proscribe what type of work you can do, uh, set your priorities. So uh, we need to not be asleep about what's happening here. All of us need to uh, defend an institution. Defend an institution. Nicole Hannah-Jones, you're wonderful. Thank you so Thank much you. Uh, for joining us. And we'll all keep our eyes open to see what you have for us next. Thank you. Always good to be in conversation. Absolutely. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, 
please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.